Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of Science and Engineering in KSP. I'm your host, Andy Leonard. Today we're going to be looking at orbital elements. Last week we showed that KSP does adhere to Kepler's laws. So now that we know that the orbits in KSP are Keplerian, we need a way to talk about them. And that's going to be our focus today. Um, so for orbital elements, their goal is to define a given orbit, and we need six different parameters to be able to do that fully. We need to know the orbit size and shape, we need to know the orientation of the orbit's plane in space, we need to know the orientation of the semi-major axis in the plane, so basically think of that as being how the orbit is rotated in its plane, and we finally need to know the location of the satellite along the orbit. Well, you should recognize a couple of these if you watched last week's episode, the semi-major axis and the eccentricity. Uh, the inclination here I briefly glossed over when I was describing Valentina's orbit. So what are these other guys? This guy here, capital omega, is the longitude of the ascending node. Uh, small omega is the argument of periapse. And for the sixth element, there's a little bit of disagreement or maybe different set of priorities, I guess, uh, as to, you know, what information you need. Um, so I went to three different books when I was making this episode, and each one used a different orbital element for the sixth one. So the T, time of periapse passage, uh, nu or theta for true anomaly, and M for mean anomaly. For now, let's use theta for true anomaly. And most places I found today use nu, but when I learned it, I used theta. So I'm just gonna stick with what I know. So let's dig into these in a little bit more detail, starting with the semi-major axis. Now it describes the size of the orbit. Uh, you might recall that a semi-major axis is half the distance of a line passing through the foci and the center. So that's this long line right here is the major axis and then just from here to here is the semi-major axis. Um, another point is it lies on the line of apsides, which is a very fancy way of saying the line where you have your apoapse and periapse, assuming this focus here is our center body. So at this point on the orbit, you are at periapse, at apoapse, um, and this line is basically defined by the semi-major axis. Moving on, to the eccentricity. It describes the shape of the orbit. Uh, in case you missed it, we talked about how when you increase the eccentricity, you flatten out your ellipse, right? And you see that the major axis gets longer and the minor axis gets shorter, and the foci move further and further away from the center. Moving on to the inclination, I. The inclination is the angle between this plane of reference here and the plane of the orbit. And it defines the orientation of the orbit. Um, so for Earth, or for any other planet pretty much, we take the plane of reference to be the equator. Um, for interplanetary spacecraft, say for instance something going from Earth to Mars, we use the ecliptic of our solar system. Now what is the ecliptic? The ecliptic is the plane that is defined by the Earth's orbit around the Sun. So as you might guess, since we define the plane, Earth has an inclination about the Sun of zero, and we measure every other body in the solar system with respect to us. Now if we're in orbit around Earth and we have a spacecraft orbiting the equator, um, our inclination, that spacecraft's inclination would be zero. But if we have a spacecraft going over the poles, directly over the North and the South Pole, then you might guess that the inclination is going to be 90 degrees. And we'll see what happens when we increase our inclination past 90 degrees when we switch over to KSP. Uh, moving on to the longitude of the ascending node, capital Omega. The longitude of the ascending node is the angle in the reference plane between a reference direction and the ascending node. So I threw a little bit of jargon at you. We'll try and parse it out here. The ascending node is the point that your orbit and your reference plane intersect. Uh, specifically, it's the point where you travel northward through the plane of reference, right? So here you're south of the equator, here you're north of the equator. So in between, you must have passed 
this ascending node. And you might guess that over here we have the descending node when you're traveling southward through the uh, plane of reference. Now what is this fixed reference direction? Um, for Earth and the solar system, because it's so far away that it's basically the same thing, we use the first point of Aries as kind of a fixed coordinate. And it's not technically fixed, but for purposes of human lifespan, it's basically fixed. It moves about a degree uh, every 70 years or so. And it's the point that the sun crosses during the vernal equinox, so in spring, uh, that special day when day time and night time are equal, um, the sun crosses that point. So we decided that it would be just kind of a good uh, reference so we could say in absence of you know any other kind of thing that you know this is our reference. And so the longitude of the ascending node just measures the angle from that to your ascending node, right? So you can imagine what would happen if we would change the longitude of the ascending node. Just imagine that you're reaching out and you're grabbing the plane of reference here and you're rotating it. So if this is your periapse and this down here would be your apoapse, if you would move the plane of reference 180 degrees, you can see how the periapse would be up here and the apoapse would be down here. Uh, moving on to the argument of periapse. The argument of periapse is a pretty similar parameter uh, rotationally, um, but instead of grabbing your plane of reference and moving it, you're grabbing the orbit and moving it with change of argument of periapse. So it's this angle small omega here, and it's the angle from the ascending node to the periapse in the plane of the orbit. So it basically defines the orientation of the semi-major axis, and so basically the orbit um, in the orbital plane. Finally, we have the true anomaly, theta, and it describes the position of the satellite on the orbit. So we have this as our celestial body, which could be a satellite, could be you know spacecraft, could be a you know, person, whatever. Um, and the true anomaly is just the angle from the periapse to the position the current position. Let's switch over to KSP where Bill, Bob, Jeb, and Valentina are in orbit, in different orbits, uh, to demonstrate some of these concepts. So here we are out in orbit. We're going to start out by uh, looking at Bill here. Bill is in what appears to be a very circular orbit and a very equatorial orbit. And if we look over here at our panel of orbital elements, we can confirm this. The eccentricity is 0 0.00003, and the inclination is about uh, like a 500th of a degree. So very, very circular, very, very, very equatorial. Um, one of the benefits of a circular orbit is that your semi-major axis is basically going to be your radius. If we switch and we can see that uh, the altitude here, basically the height above the surface, is 80 kilometers and we have a semi-major axis of 680 kilometers. So uh, remember the 600 comes from the radius of Kerbin, so we, you know, we have our altitude and radius and everything built in there for circular orbits. But the problem with circular and equatorial orbits is that you can't really trust these last three readings here. Why? Well, um, if you think about it, the periapse and the apoapse are really kind of weirdly defined. Now that's fine here in Kerbal Space Program where it's just simplified uh, Keplerian orbits, but in real life we have all kinds of perturbations. We have solar radiation pressure that's gonna you know, push on our spacecraft and accelerate it in ways that we don't want to unless we're using solar sails. Um, we are going to have gravitational perturbations from uh, Jupiter and from the moon and from the sun and we are also going to be accelerating differently around different parts of the planet because of the uh, non-uniform mass distribution and the shape of the earth. Um, so 
with all those kind of changes, we are going to see a very rapid change in periapps and apoapps just for a little bit of acceleration. And it's going to make these angles really jump around. And so we can see that. I have, I'm not enabling my main engine here. All I'm using are these tiny little maneuvering thrusters called RCS, the uh, reaction control system. Um, very, very simple stuff. And we are just going to lightly fire normal to our orbit, meaning that we're going to be shooting this way. We're going to be firing in a normal direction. And I'll get into maneuvers in a later episode. Um, I think I want to dedicate uh, an episode to delta V and the rocket equation and all that good stuff before we get to the math of maneuvering. But just for kind of a simple demonstration of you know how quickly this can go pear-shaped, check this out. See? Just how very quickly everything's changing there. And so it's these angles for this orbit are really really poorly defined and so for circular orbits for uh, equatorial orbits and for circular equatorial orbits um, each one of those situations has a series of modified orbital elements where we talk about things in terms of uh, cosines and sines and we use this kind of different angle approximations to make everything nicer and a little bit easier to digest. Now again if you we look at our periaps here and I'm going to do basically just the same kind of maneuvers, do you see how quickly and how by how much the periaps changes, right? So yeah, for circular equatorial orbits, um, don't don't believe don't believe what the math tells you. Uh, because it will change and it will change fast and it will it will uh, can trip you up if you aren't paying attention um, let's switch over to Bob Bob is in a more inclined orbit more eccentric orbit um, yeah 45 degrees and 0.279 eccentricity um, so let's take a look and see what we can figure out. Well, the argument of periapse is 44 degrees. So if we look from our equator and we measure in the plane of the orbit, yeah, that looks, that looks to be about 45 degrees to me. Hopefully it does to you as well. Whoops, knocking everything around here. And the inclination we launched into was 45 degrees. So if, say, we launched from here on the equator, the, in KSP by default, the launch site is on the equator. There's mods where you can change that, though. And then we just launched directly into this orbit of 45 degrees. Now, geometrically, what kind of does the inclination mean? Um, the inclination basically tells you the the limit of what latitudes you're going to be able to fly directly over, right? So at this point here, like I guess, let me see if I can find. So the highest point on, basically the, the highest you can fly directly over is going to be 45 degrees north or uh, 45 degrees south. So when you're designing an orbit, that's something that you have to take into consideration. Um, how much of the map do you want to be able to cover? We'll, we'll get into ground tracks in uh, a later episode. Um, but just think about that. And, you know, if you want to, say you're scanning for resources or something, you want to cover as much of the map as possible. Well, it's uh, pretty easy. You just make your inclination 90 like we've done with Jeb. Uh, please clap and uh, get out your guacamole bowls for Jeb. You know, that's that's an old joke, um, but it's still funny, in my opinion. It's an oldie but a goodie. So yeah, you can see that Jeb uh, is also in a basically circular orbit like we had with Bill, but uh, the difference is he is in what's called a polar orbit because he's flying 
basically directly over each of the polar ice caps here with the North and South Pole and yeah we are pretty much basically polar um, so this would be perturbed pretty pretty quickly um, what you'll also see that's uh, inclined a little bit past a polar inclination but uh, it resembles polar is what's called a sun synchronous orbit and we'll I think in a future episode we'll talk more about why sun synchronous orbits you can't really achieve them in stock KSP. Um, it has to do with the mass distribution of everything in the planet and so you, you're basically using the fact that Earth kind of bulges at the equator a little bit to design an orbit such that every time you cross the equator going north you are uh, you're doing it at the same local solar time maybe get more into that later um, so what happens once you increase your inclination past 90 degrees well, you probably already know this but we'll switch over to Valentina to get a better picture of it all right, so I'm cutting back in here now because I realized that I forgot to talk about the longitude of the ascending node here. So I apologize, it's a little disjointed, but I didn't want to record the uh, same 10 minutes over again and hopefully, you know, not forget something else I wanted to talk about. So um, remember that the longitude of the ascending node is the counterclockwise angle from some reference direction to the point where you cross the reference equator, uh, the uh, reference plane, which for us is the equator. Um, so let's see if we can figure out where that reference direction is. Starting from here, zero degrees, 180 degrees, this would be 270 degrees. Our information tells us that the longitude of ascending node is 280 degrees so it would just be let's click on the planet here hopefully we get this right so that's 270 so 280 would be like somewhere around there-ish and what do we see well it looks like it's pointing towards the Sun doesn't it um, so would that make sense to have it just always pointing at the sun? No, it's probably the direction in the sky that the sun sits when you start the game. So year one, day one, this is a relatively new save. So I'm willing to bet, I'm, I would have to look it up, um, but I'm willing to bet that that's the reference direction that the developers chose. Yeah, I'm only on day four here. Uh, because I do a lot of reverting and uh, screwing around and I'm you know only on the second episode so yeah I thought that was kinda cool to find out I never really thought about where this reference direction was supposed to be until I uh, set out to make this video um, so that's pretty cool um, we'll end the cut here the invasive cut and start talking about Valentina we end up traveling against the direction of the planet's rotation. Um, keep your eye on Bill here and Valentina and watch what happens when I speed up time. See, they're going opposite directions, right? So usually you'll see players get to orbit by launching and then just going, turning east. Now, what's the point of that? They are using the, the rotational speed of Kerbin as kind of an aid to get to orbit, and it's a very efficient, very helpful way to get to orbit. Now, what I did with Valentina here was I launched her going uh, pretty far west. I guess this could be sort of northwest-ish. Um, and that's worse. You have the planet you know going the other way so you have to actually subtract its rotational speed instead of 
adding its rotational speed to yours as you gain speed and accelerate and hope to get into orbit. Um, but retrograde orbits can be uh, very useful for certain applications. Um, did I go into, I can't remember whether or not I talked about going, traveling with the direction of the rotation of the planet like Bill is here, uh, is called prograde and Valentina's motion is called retrograde. Um, interestingly, kind of bit of side bit here, but I've been reading Gene Kranz's memoirs. He was um, flight director at NASA for many years. If you've seen the movie Apollo 13, he was the Ed Harris character uh, that wore a vest and, you know, kind of no-nonsense kind of guy. But when he talks about orbits, he uses the word posigrade for prograde now, which I thought was very interesting. It's always kind of cool to see how uh, the language we use to describe things, so I guess, you know, language, um, changes over time. Just interesting side note. Um, well, thank you for watching. I had fun making it. Hope you had fun watching it. Um, I'll be back next week. I still am not 100% sure uh, what next week's topic is going to be. Um, it could be talking about different special orbits, so orbits like geostationary, and uh, we'll talk more about why uh, sun-synchronous orbits can't be done in stock KSP, and we might even talk about the Molnaya orbit, which is a very cool piece of uh, Soviet wizardry um, that kind of solves the problem of communication satellites uh, for high latitudes. But um, I guess I'll see you next week. Thanks again for watching.